Grace Bible Church, Pearlside, online. The F word rarely used in a moment of pure anger is forgiveness. Pastor Billy Lau reveals the root of our anger so we can process true forgiveness in his message, You Mad Bro? The conclusion of our series, Blueprint, Discovering God's Design for Relationships. I just want to uh, thank you for braving the traffic and fighting to get here. How many were stuck in traffic on the way? You know, I just always think about it every time I'm stuck in traffic and, and just frustrated as all. I mean, Jesus left heaven, you know, to come to earth and suffer for us. So surely I can suffer through some traffic um, in my air-conditioned car to get to where I got to get to, especially when it comes to church. Amen. And uh, th- this evening, we are concluding our series, um, Blueprint, God's Design for Relationships, by talking about a message on forgiveness. Now, I know none of you have ever been offended before, <laughs> but all of us, if we just live enough life, we're going to go through seasons where we're offended, where people make us angry, and we're going to have to exercise this thing called forgiveness. And it never feels good. It's never, it's never something that we look forward to, but it's an inevitability in life, like death, death and taxes. Right next to that is you're going to get pissed at someone, and you're going to have to forgive them. That's just kind of, it's going to happen. And I know that might have happened to you today, maybe while you were stuck in traffic. So maybe right now, just forgive that guy. Just forgive him. It wasn't me, because I was coming from that way. Forgive him anyway, all right? And, uh, and, uh, and, And it's important that we get it, because if we don't learn how to do this thing called forgiveness, which the Bible talks about over and over and over again, the reality is it becomes toxic in our soul. Our souls begin to get hardened and hard, and we become... We begin to give off these negative vibes to everyone that you're around. Anyone ever been around someone who has a bitter, toxic spirit? Yeah, how many of you enjoy being around that type of a person? Not really, right? Maybe they're a coworker, maybe they're a classmate, maybe hopefully not your family member, hopefully not the person sitting right next to you. But you've ever been, if you've ever been around someone who's bitter, oh, that was nervous laughter. It was like, (laughs) And if you don't know, maybe it's you, I'm just saying. But, you know, and if you've ever been around that kind of a person, just kind of gives you this vibe where you're like, man, I don't really want to be around that person, right? If if, if, if everyone's going out to dinner and say, hey, you want to come? You're kind of thinking, is that person going to be there? Because I don't want to hear another negative story. I don't want to hear any negative comments and cynicism come out of that, that bitter, toxic spirit. And the reality is, beyond just what we give off to other people, unforgiveness and bitterness harms ourselves as well. You realize scientists are now beginning to find out that the cause of a lot of unknown medical conditions, a lot of it roots back to unresolved bitterness and anger in our own lives. See, when we're angry, when we're upset with someone, our bodies, our brains actually release this chemical called cortisol. It's a stress hormone. It activates the fight or flight mechanism in our body, which whether we're going to defend ourselves or run or get out of the way, and, and it's helpful in a moment. If you're being attacked, you need that. It helps you fight or flight. But we're not meant to live in a state of fight or flight. We're not meant to live with a constant state of cortisol running through our bodies, causing us constant stress. It begins to eat away at our body. It begins to eat away at our our heart, our lungs, everything. And we wonder why our bodies begin to fall apart. A lot of it has to do with unresolved forgiveness or unforgiveness in our lives. And is it any wonder that Jesus talks about it so much? So tonight, as we conclude our series, we want to talk about this issue of unforgiveness. And the message is entitled, You Mad Bro? Pastor Kalai came up with that title. He's the master of titles. My message would have been the foundation of forgiveness. <laughs> Nerd, right? <laughs> it's about as good as I get. So thank you, Pastor Kalai. You spice up my life. Anyway, let's look at what the Bible says. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 is, is the passage we're going to start with. It says this. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God. Can you fall short of the grace of God? Apparently, yes. And that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are a God that wants to set us free from every bondage that we will face in life, including the bondages that are as the result of other people sinning against us. You don't want us to live in bondage but freedom. And so I pray tonight as we get into your word that even as you begin to dredge up old memories and old hurts, that above all of that, you will infuse into us this spirit of forgiveness, the grace to love and forgive the way that you did. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. You know, they say that there are two ways that you can handle 
uh, you know, when someone's attacking you. As I mentioned earlier, it's either fight or flight. Either you're going to fight, put up your dukes, and just, you know, let them have it, or you're going to run away or kind of avoid the situation. Now, just by a show of hands, how many of you, when you, uh, you know, someone's offending you or hurting you, respond more with a, a fight kind of a mentality? You, you, you fight back. Yeah, you get, you get your sass on, right? You get, a little, you get a little sassy, you get a little mean. Maybe, you know, you, you know what I'm saying, right? You just kind of, right? That, that, that's, that, okay, that's right. How many of you then, the rest of us would be the flight people? Flight, you tend to shut down, run away, want to avoid it. I'm more like that, all right? I'm a, I'm a lover, not a fighter, okay? So I, I prefer to, to, to avoid conflict rather than enter into it, it's just the way that I'm wired. You know, it's funny, I, I have two kids, and um, I see the differences in my two kids, my son Micah, he's six years old. He's more the flight type of person. I, when there's conflict with, with me or even with his sister, he kind of just doesn't want to avoid it. He, he wants to avoid it. Oh, there they are. Wow, I didn't know you had that picture. Oh, All right, anyway, uh, that's my son. He's, he's more the flight type of person. He doesn't want to deal with the conflict, so he'll kind of shut down when his sister steals his stuff. He just kind of, I don't want to deal with you. I don't play with you. I don't want to go there. You know, he just, he, this way. Maddie, on the other hand, who's four, she's fight. We witnessed this just the other day, yesterday, all right? I don't even know what the conflict was, but all of a sudden, I just saw her run, boom, hit Micah, and he flew. He's like 10 pounds, 15 pounds, and he flew. And my wife and I were looking at each other, we're like, whoa, imagine standing there like, what? You know what I mean? I was like, and then Naomi's like, you're gonna talk to her? I was like, nah, man, that's awesome. I want her to do that more. I know dads with daughters, you want your daughters to be fighters, but she's a fighter, man, like Ronda Rousey, she they just took him down and just started grounding and pounding, you know, but, but I see the differences even just in my own kids, and, and, and you say, well, which way is the better way, Pastor Billy? The reality is, you know, the flight maybe won't have as much immediate violence, <laughs> but in reality, they're both bad. Because when we, whether we, we crack the guy right in the moment or if we bottle it up for years, eventually it's going to come out. If we stuff down resentment and pain and hurt that was done to you, however you respond to it, eventually it's going to come out. And as scripture says here, a bitter root grows up and it defiles many. It doesn't just hurt the person you lash out at, it hurts you eventually as well. And that's why I want to propose to us tonight a third option that is neither fight nor flight. I don't have an F word for it, so, you know, but it's, it's come to God and let him deal with what's inside of you. Rather than fighting the person and projecting your hurt on them or running away and avoiding it, it's focus, maybe, F. Yeah, focus on Jesus and let him figure out, F. Oh, here it comes. It's coming. Hallelujah. It's coming, right? Focus and figure what your problem is. <laughs> what's going on in you? <laughs> focus in Jesus and figure out what's going on in here. What's that funk inside of you? There it is, that, that God wants to deal with inside of you. And, and it's precisely what happens here in this story that we're going to look at in Genesis chapter 4. It's one of the first stories that happens after the fall in the garden where Adam and Eve were kicked out. We see the story of Cain and Abel. It's a famous story. Most of you have heard it, even if you didn't grow up going to church. But it's a story where Cain kills his brother Abel. And I want us to see how he responds to this and how God responds to him. And maybe there's some lessons to us in how we deal with our conflicts. Verse 4 of Genesis chapter 4. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must, say you must, you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. Where they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied, am I my brother's keeper? The first point there in your notes says this, deal with anger early and discover the root. Discover the root. Notice that Cain had an issue in his life. There was anger coming up in his life. And the first thing that God does when he comes to him is he asks him this diagnostic question, why are you angry? Why are you angry? That's a very important question that we need to ask. And I think it's a question that God asks us and wants us to ask ourselves. Why are you angry? Every time we get offended or hurt or bitter or something happens, we're tempted to project our anger on the other person. It's because of that person. It's because of Abel that my life sucks. It's because of this person that this is happening. But notice God doesn't even bring up Abel. He doesn't say, well, I know he's kind of like this. And he doesn't do that. He just goes straight to Cain. He says, what's going on in your heart? Why are you angry? And that's the first question we need to ask ourselves rather than fight or flight is figure out what's going on in here. What's God trying to do inside of here? And what's he trying to show us in here? 
See, though he dishonored God, see, the problem was Cain didn't offer the right sacrifice to God. He should have known better, but he's the one that offered the wrong sacrifice. Abel did the right thing. So he was the one who he should have said, yeah, well, I'm the one who screwed up, so it's only right that, I, you know, I shouldn't be mad at him. It's me that screwed up. You see that? But he didn't ask that question. He, didn't, he just kept looking at his brother and saying, well, I just don't like him. He was projecting his own hurt, his own rejection issues onto his brother Abel when he had nothing to do with it. But God wanted him to stop and pause and ask that question, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? See, anger is a gift. I know we don't like to think of it that way, but anger is a gift, just like pain is a gift. How many of you think that pain is a great thing? No, we hate pain. I mean, if, if, if men had to give birth, there'd be no children in the world because we don't like pain. Women, you, you're, you're gifted, man. You are gifted by God. My wife, is at, we're having a, our third child. We just found out this past week that it's a girl, by the way. So um, we don't have a name yet, so I'm starting a pool. You know, if any of you want to, you know, throw in. Uh, the highest bidder, you know, all the money will go to feed starving children, Micah and Maddie, and whatever we name this third one. So, <laughs> all right, someone else used that joke here, yeah. Was it Seth? Anyway. Um, but, we, you know, we found out it's a girl, and uh, she's willing to go through the pain. I don't know, I don't understand why. <laughs> I don't get it. It's the grace of God. But in general, pain is not a good thing. We don't like it. But the reality is pain tells us that something's wrong with our physical bodies, does it not? If you don't feel pain, that's actually a medical condition that is very dangerous because you don't know if you're bleeding or you have internal bleeding or you're dying. You don't know if you don't, you don't ever experience pain. You don't ever know if something's wrong. And just like pain is a gift to tell us something's wrong with our physical bodies, anger is a gift to tell us that something's wrong with our spiritual selves, with our emotions. The, pain, the anger tells us, man, something is wrong. But often what we do when anger comes in is we just want to avoid it. It'd be like if you had a toothache, right? And instead of deciding, man, I better go to the doctor and see what's going on behind this pain, we just put that numbing stuff on it. I, well, I don't feel any pain anymore, it must be gone. No, you just numb the pain, and that rot that's going on is getting worse and worse and worse. It's not going away. And similarly, if we avoid the anger in our lives and don't ever deal with the root, it doesn't go away, it just gets worse. It festers. Like a, like, a, like a diseased tooth that's going to need to be excised one day, eventually that anger, if not dealt with and processed, will result in something worse happening. It will result not necessarily to physical death, but relational death, and that's what we see here with Cain. He didn't process why he was mad. If he'd have stopped, he would have seen, well, why I'm really mad is because I'm the one who did the wrong offering, not my brother Abel. Why am I mad at him? But instead, he just keeps on feeling like, man, God's always against me. He favors my brother. He doesn't stop to ask the question, and he, and he ends up lashing out, murdering his brother. I want to ask you a question tonight. What areas of your relational life have you been experiencing anger and frustration? What could that be revealing about your relationships, or what, what's, what could be at the root of that? And now I know sometimes it's really that that person wronged you and that person did something wrong. But sometimes, many times, God is also trying to surface something in us. You know, when I first got married, I, I told you guys this a couple of weeks ago, you know, my wife and I are different as night and day. I mean, the only thing we have in common is Jesus. Thank God that's the most important thing we have in common, right? Now we got two kids, so we got them in common and three and, you know, and a couple TV shows. But anyway, but, you know, it, it's, it's all that we need because he's, he's all that matters, right? But, but here's what I realized, that when we first got married, because of those differences, I used to get frustrated with her a lot. I used, to, I, used to, I used to secretly, I've never told her this out, I mean, she heard it on a couple weeks ago, but I used to secretly say, God, what is wrong with this woman that you gave me? <laughs> I know none of you married people, Josh, you're laughing way too hard, man. You know, that, I know none of you have ever thought that. What is wrong with this person? You, you, you think about some of these, your coworkers or your boss or your friends, you go, God, what is wrong with this person? I used to say that to, to, about my wife. What is wrong with her? Why is she always like this? Why does she always do that? Why does she always sneak up on me? You know, why, why are these things? And one day as I was praying about it, I felt the Lord say this to me. Everything that you perceive to be wrong with her, I've intended to deal with what's wrong in you. I'm going to say that again. God, this is, God this, is, this is profound to me at least. He told me this. Anything that you perceive to be wrong with her is meant to deal with everything that's wrong in you. See, he, he, God allows us to, to have these conflicts sometimes to grate against us on purpose to rub off the rough edges and the things don't be, that don't belong in our lives. If we got along and there was perfect harmony, we would never change. If there was always perfect harmony, I, we would never grow. We'd just stay comfortable where we are. But instead, God allows us to put us, puts us in relationships with, that are tense sometimes. Relationships that are challenging because it forces us to grow. And yes, sometimes God allows relationships that are hard. 
because it's meant to bring us closer to Jesus and to look to Jesus and to allow him to shape us in the process. You ever notice that when things are good, you don't go to God? Yeah, when things are going well, we tend to just forget him. But when there's challenges and trials, then we run to God because God wants us to deal with what's going on inside of us. And if we don't pause and stop and look what's going on inside first, we might lash out on someone else later on. The perfect example of this tragic example is the Charleston shooting that took place a couple of months ago, perpetrated by that young man by the name of Dylan Roof. He had no reason to be mad at those Emmanuel church members, did he? In fact, when he walked into that church in Charleston, they treated him with love, they treated him with, with grace, they treated him with favor. And, there, and after, after he, he executed the massacres, he told a sheriff's detective that he almost didn't go through with it because they were so nice to him. He didn't know them. He had no reason to lash out at them. He was projecting unresolved hurts in his own life that happened years ago onto innocent people who had no business in his life. Why did he do that? Because of unresolved hurt in his own life. Now, am I saying, Pastor Billy, are you saying if I don't deal with the hurt in my life, I'm going to go shooting people? I'm not necessarily saying that. But what I am saying is God wants us to deal with the hurts and the wounds in our own life. We find out now that Dylan Roof had a, had a troubled background. He was neglected and abused, and he turned to drugs almost his entire young adult life to cope with his own pain. And he started blaming his troubles on, on, on races and minorities. Where did that come from? It came from an unresolved anger in his own life. And how many of us understand also that the devil's gonna get involved with that? He will empower our bitterness to lash out violently. I'm not saying you're gonna do that, but I am saying it will cause relational deaths in your own life if we don't deal with the anger and the hurt. Can I hear an amen to that? Amen. See, God wants us to start with ourselves. That's why Jesus said, before you attempt to deal with the speck in your brother's eye, deal with what? The plank in your own eye. In other words, treat your sin as greater than their sin and deal with that first. See your sin as much bigger than theirs, like a two by four coming out of your eye. See it as that. Deal with your own sin first before you even attempt to wipe the speck out of your brother's eye. Often we don't do that. We see them having a plank in their eye, and ah, mine is just a speck, God. You know, my, my sin is just, oh, just let it just wipe them out, let them walk up here, up here, right? It's, it's just small. But we see their sin is, oh, man, but, you, but what they did, God. No, God says, no, flip it, reverse it. Deal with you, and then he goes on later, as we'll see, I'll deal with them, all right? Next in your notes, sometimes, though, we have legitimate reasons to be mad at others. Even when we deal with ourselves and we, and we deal with our sin, sometimes people really do hurt us. Isn't that true? Sometimes re people really do horrible things to us. In your notes, it says, can choose to forgive repeatedly no matter how we feel. Now watch this. God shows us what forgiveness is like in the way that he responded to Cain. Verse 14. Today you are driving me from the land, Cain said, because he killed his brother. God has pronounced judgment on him, kicked him out of the land. And I will be hidden from your presence, and I will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Whoever finds me will kill me, Cain said. So he's understanding the gravity of his decision and the, the consequences that come. But watch how God responds to Cain. But the Lord said to him, not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain made love to his wife and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch, his son. Cain was then building a city and named it after his son Enoch. Wait a second. God, you didn't kill Cain for killing his brother in cold-blooded murder. You let him go and you let him continue on with his life and you even bless him because Enoch, the Bible tells us, was a righteous man. And you let his line continue. God, why did you do that to Cain? He deserved to be cut off. He should have been killed. God showed us from the very beginning, from the very beginning, even at the first sin outside of the garden, that the, that the best response, his response to sin is grace. He showed us from the very beginning forgiveness and mercy and grace, even in the face of the worst sin perpetrated. He, Cain killed his brother in cold blood. He had no reason to do it. But look how God treated him with grace. Now, I don't know how you feel in hearing this, but it kind of rubs me the wrong way. I kind of want to see Cain smashed. I kind of want someone outside to, yeah, kill him. He deserves it. But that's not how God rolls. See, sometimes we have a picture of God that is less than biblical. And then we treat people as a response to that. Well, if you hurt me, then I'm going to hurt you back. If you sin against me, well, then I'm going to sin against you. And Jesus will forgive me because I'm under grace. No, it doesn't work that way. Jesus says, the Bible tells us to forgive those who sin against us. Look at what it says here in Matthew chapter 18. Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? See, Peter thought he was being a good dude because in 
in, in the rabbinical law of the time, you, you only had to forgive someone three times. And after the third time, if they sin against you, you call the boys, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, mob them. Right? I mean, seriously. And so Peter goes, well, what about seven times? He thought he was being all holy. I'll, I'll give him four extra, you know, coupons. Right? I'll give him four more, four more. And then Jesus says, hold on. I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Another translation says 70 times, seven times. What Jesus is saying is, as many times as someone sins against you, that's as many times as you forgive them. You, you don't count it. You don't count it. And that goes so counterintuitive to the way that many of us are wired. Isn't that true? It rubs us the wrong way. Why would I forgive this person who sinned against me? Well, the reason why we do it is because that's how God treats us. The reason why we forgive others in this way is because that's the way that God has treated us. And when we receive the gospel in our lives, it should change the way that we view sin and consequences because our sin deserves eternal separation from God. But instead of God doing that, as in the way he treated Cain, he brings us into, back into relationship with him. In fact, he goes so far as to send his only son to die on the cross for our sins so that we can be forgiven even though we've sinned against him. That's the gospel. And when we, when we receive the forgiveness of God in our lives, how can we then hold unforgiveness against our brother or sister who sins against us? As heinous as it may be, as evil as it may be, the Bible tells us, just as Christ forgave you, so forgive those who sin against you. Now that's hard, amen, thank you. Y'all can agree with him too, you know, oh, amen, yeah. Right? As, as hard as it may be, that's what the Bible tells us to do, but we don't hear that in our culture. We don't, we don't see movies about forgiveness, right? We see movies about, you know, they killed his daughter, they killed his wife, now he's getting vengeance. You know what I'm saying? That's what the movie's about. No one would see a movie about, you know, they did this, they did this, and he forgave, right? You know, Liam Neeson, I have a special, a very specific set of skills. I forgive you. You know what I'm saying? Movie's over. <laughs> That's from Taken, by the way, right? But why, because it doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't sell, it's not exciting, it's confusing, it doesn't make sense, but, but that's what the Bible tells us to do. And we can only do that if we trust that there is a God in heaven who eventually will vindicate our cause, who will uphold us, who will defend us, and that there is an eternity in heaven that we will spend experiencing the joy and the blessing of God as we trust him here on this earth. If all that we have is this earth, then yeah, man, go get vengeance, because this is all that you have. But when you understand the gospel, that there is more yet to come, we can look at the face of even evil perpetrated against us and say, I forgive you. You know, after Dylan Roof killed those, those nine innocent victims in that church, a race-filled hate crime, what amazes me is just a few days later, family members who lost their loved ones, what did they do? They forgave him. They went publicly on television at the church service just following those, the massacre. They went publicly to forgive the man who murdered their family members. How, how, how can you do that? Why would you do that? Unless Jesus Christ has radically changed your heart. And now we're not, no longer continuing the cycle of violence and hate. We begin a new cycle which Jesus began. He absorbed all the violence into himself and he, and he gives us grace and he calls us to be agents of reconciliation by forgiving those who hurt us. Look at what the Bible says here in Colossians chapter three. Therefore, as God's chosen people, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you have a grievance against someone. Forgive, what does it say? As the Lord forgave you. How has the Lord forgiven you? If you've received Jesus Christ, guess what? He's forgiven you totally, totally. Of the worst sins that you've ever committed, of the sins that you're afraid of, man, if I told anyone, if ever, anyone ever found out, man, they wouldn't want to have anything to do with me. Well, guess what? Jesus knows. And when we receive Christ, it says he forgives us completely. Therefore, we, as God's chosen people, are to forgive as the Lord forgave us. In verse 14, and over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. You know that, that, that verb to put on. It says clothe yourself, to put on. It's, it, it, it's literally the same word that's used when a person says, you know, the Bible tells them they put on their robe or they put on their cloak. It's like putting on clothes. Now, I don't know how you felt when you got dressed today. I didn't feel much emotion for this shirt. It was, it was on sale, so I bought it, you know what I mean? TJ Maxx. Uh, and, and I put it on. I was like, hey, there it is. I'm gonna put it on. I kind of like the shoes, so I put those on choicefully, but that's not a word. But the shirt, I didn't really have much emotion for, so I put it on. And you know what? Sometimes that's, that's exactly what forgiveness is. We don't have any feeling for it, 
We may have feelings against it, but we, cho- we choose to put it on. I choose to clothe myself with forgiveness, even though everything inside of me doesn't want to. And I believe that's, and I know that's what the Charleston families had to choose to do, to choose to forgive, even though they didn't feel like it in the moment, we put it on. And the awesome thing is as we put it on and we choose to put it on repeatedly, as many times as as necessary, God begins to change our heart as we clothe ourselves with forgiveness and kindness, just as the Lord forgave us. And that's why the gospel has to be the foundation of our lives. Because when we want to exact vengeance against someone who who does something to us, we have to look back to the cross where Jesus said, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. He didn't say, as he was hanging there on the cross, just wait, (laughs) I'm coming back and all you suckers gonna burn. He didn't say that, did he? He didn't say that. Some of us, that's how we live. We live, oh yeah, wrong me one more time, right? What, what? You know what I mean, right? right? We, get, we get all nuts when a person just looks at us, right? Jesus didn't do that. I mean, they, were, they, were, they, they beat him, they, they, they stuck him up on a cross, nails in his wrists and his thighs, insulting him, spitting on him. The king of the universe came all this way to get all that abuse. And what does he say at the end? Forgive them, because they don't know what they're doing. And he loved us to the very end. When you were in your sin, guess what Jesus was doing? He was loving you. When you were lost and offending other people and hurting yourself and hurting others, guess what Jesus was doing? He was trying to draw you to himself. He was drawing us to himself. That's how Jesus treats sinners and that's how he calls us to respond to those who even sin against us. Now watch this. Forgiveness displays the gospel. It displays the gospel. I'll close with this story. I'll save it for the end. But forgiveness, in your notes there, is trusting that God will deal justly on our behalf. It's trusting that God will deal justly on our behalf. Therefore, we don't have to exact our own justice because there is a perfect judge in heaven that will, do, will, that will act out justice one day. He will deal with them. Look at what it says here in, in Romans chapter 12 because forgiveness doesn't mean letting people go and they can just get away with their crime. No, no, no. We're actually letting them go to a higher court. I don't have, I'm not gonna be the one to deal justice to you, but God will. And I don't know about you, but the Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. And God will deal with them. Look at what it says here in Romans chapter 12. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with anyone. Verse 19. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for what? God's wrath. Leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. I think what this scripture is telling us is that when we... hold on to the rights to get vengeance for those that have wronged us we're we're holding God's hand back because now God has to deal with us right if Pastor Tim does something to me and he offends me and I'm just trying to get vengeance on him you know it's almost it's almost like God goes I got to deal with you first because you're my child and you're holding unforgiveness against someone else you don't understand the gospel very well I kind of need to pound on you a little bit to get you to understand it and then maybe I'll go deal with him. But for now, I got to work on you. You're my child. It's like, you know, my, my kids, I'm not going to go spank someone else's kid. You know what I mean? If, if Micah and some other kid have a problem, I'm going to deal with him. I mean, son, what'd you do? You're right? I'll deal with you. I'm not going to deal with him. And because we're God's children, he's going to start with us. But here's the awesome thing. If we choose to forgive, the Bible promises us that he will deal with them. He will deal, he will deal with those that hurt us and offend us and do wrong to us. God is the ultimate judge one day. And one day he will judge all sin. He will judge all wrongdoing. And we have to trust that. We may not see it this side of heaven, but we have to trust that God will deal justly and righteously on our behalf. And that's why forgiveness is an issue of faith. Do we trust that God is ultimately in control and will deal? And then lastly, watch this. Forgiveness is immediate and unconditional. Trust is gradual, conditional, and only if possible. There's a difference between forgiveness and trust. Forgiveness is immediate. It's a choice that we make to, I'm not going to drink the poison and expect you to die. I'm going to choose to forgive and put you in the hands of God. But it doesn't mean we have to trust them. Trust is earned. Especially if you've been violated, you've been abused. Forgive them so that the, 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 the bitterness in your own heart doesn't wreck you and defile others. Forgive them so that you apply the gospel to your life and, and not drive a wedge between you and God. But that doesn't mean you have to trust them. Trust is earned particularly if you've been offended badly and violated. There are people that I've forgiven that I still don't trust to this day. That doesn't mean I haven't forgiven. The issue is, did I forgive them in my heart? Did they earn the trust back? And so we have to know when, when we need to draw a boundary in our lives and, don't not, and not be guilted into, well, if you forgive me, then things should go back to normal. No, 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 you have to earn that trust back. Forgiveness is unconditional. Trust is earned. Look at what 2 Corinthians, uh, Matthew 3 says. 
produce fruit in keeping with repentance. If there's true repentance, there will be fruit. There, there should be evidence in a person's life that, that they're really repented. We don't forgive if they repent. We forgive anyway, but we don't trust if there isn't change. Does that make sense? 2 Corinthians 7 says, See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point you have proved yourselves. There should be evidence of change in a person's life if there's true repentance. But forgiveness isn't conditional, it's unconditional. Trust is conditional. And I want to close with this thought. As we think about what if it means to be offended and to forgive, again, it all goes back to the gospel. Forgiveness is a picture of the gospel. When we forgive those who wrong us, we display the same love and mercy and grace that Jesus Christ displayed to us. Now, I know as, we've been, as I've been talking tonight, you've probably been thinking about people and situations that, that have been coming up and dredging up memories. And you know what? God wants, to, wants us to, 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 to apply the gospel to those situations and say, God, I choose to forgive, not because they deserve it, but because you do. I choose to forgive them, not because they deserve my forgiveness, but because you have forgiven me. And just as you've forgiven me, I now choose to forgive that person. That's why Jesus says later on, if we don't forgive those who sin against us, he won't forgive us. Why? Because it's a, if we don't forgive others, it demonstrates that we don't understand the gospel. It demonstrates that we don't understand how much we've been forgiven. So think about the people that have offended you, that have hurt you. Can you forgive them today? And I know that's tough. I know it's hard. I know it hurts. And that's why we choose to do it every day and sometimes 10 times a day, sometimes 100 times a day. But as we continue to forgive, the gospel goes deeper in our hearts and it changes us and it frees us from the snare of unforgiveness. I want to close with this story. We talked about Dylan Roof and the Emmanuel church members that were brutally murdered by that cowardice act. And I found this article on Al Jazeera's website. If any of you know what Al Jazeera is, it's the Arab, you know, version of like CNN. And, you know, they, they never report on, on, on stuff, Christian stuff positively because it's obviously an Arab news station. But I want you to li listen to this. It's, it's a little lengthy, but watch what they said in response to how the church members forgave Dylan Roof. The title of the article is Christian Forgiveness is Transforming the South. This is an Arab website reporting on this. Dylan Roof's first court appearance after the June 17 murder of nine worshipers at the Emmanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina. Several families of the vi victims offered forgiveness to the man who did not deserve it. Why were they so quick to forgive? The families were simply exercising a fundamental Christian virtue. When we suffer injustice, the human heart craves vengeance, vindication, and retaliation. There are also desires, these are also desires Christ came to save us from. This is Al Jazeera. Christians are commanded to respond to injustice with forgiveness. This principle is central to Jesus' teaching on the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Immediately after this prayer, Jesus tells his disciples, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. This is an Arab news station preaching the gospel on their website, okay? Later, the gospel of Matthew, Peter asked Jesus, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother? And he goes on to read that passage. The swift forgiveness offered by the victim's families, as hard as it must have been, is what Christianity is all about. Come on now, somebody should be excited about that. The gospel is being preached because people chose to forgive when they shouldn't have. Because they chose to obey Jesus above their feelings. The gospel is preached in the world. Forgiveness is an extension of love, he goes on. Christians extend forgiving love to those who have wronged them, including their enemies, because this is God's disposition towards them. God is love, and he calls his people to love. God forgives first, and he expects his people to do the same. The grace of forgiveness, in turn, empowers forgiven people to forgive others. The grace of God empowers forgiven people to forgive others. You know, we wonder sometimes, man, is anything going to come out of me suffering and me choosing to forgive? Let me tell you what, what's going to come from it. The gospel is proclaimed. When they see you forgive your family members, your friends who've wronged you, when they see you forgive even the most evil perpetrated against you, the gospel is proclaimed. People can't understand it. They go, why would you forgive? Why would you forgive that person? How could you forgive them? Well, I'll tell you how. Jesus Christ forgave me. See, the reason why we can't forgive sometimes is because we haven't received forgiveness. 
We don't understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you're here today and you're struggling with this whole forgiveness thing, I want to tell you, go back to the gospel, which says Jesus Christ forgave you of all your sin, saving you from an eternity of hell. And he says, in the same way, forgive others. And as we choose to do that, the gospel is not just proclaimed with our lips, it is displayed with our lives. That's what this is all about. I know some of you have been hurt really badly in life. And as we choose to forgive, God will work powerfully on your behalf. He will. He will. Many of you have heard my testimony before. My dad, um, you know, was a drug dealer when I was a kid, grew up, left our family, went to jail for many years, and I was very bitter at him. And I remember when I first learned about forgiveness, it didn't make any sense to me. Why would I forgive this person? He never said sorry to me. He never did anything to, to, to reconcile with me. I'll forgive him when he asks for it. And then, I, and then I heard the gospel preached to me that said, no, 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 you forgive because Jesus forgave you, regard, regardless if they ever ask for it or not. And as I chose to forgive, God began to heal my heart. He began to heal my soul, and he began to heal our relationship. And today, me and my dad have a great relationship, and he may have driven you here in the shuttle because he now works for our staff. God has totally brought our relationship full circle, transformed his life, transformed mine. But if I didn't forgive him, Man, maybe there would have been a wedge that would have never been broken. Maybe there would have been a wall that had never come down. And the grace of God may not have been poured out in my life or his. And some of you have gone through some really tough stuff, but I want to encourage you, forgive as Christ forgave you and watch what he can do to change your circumstances. Amen. In front of you, you'll find a communion cup. It may be on the corner of your, your, your chair leg or in the seat pocket in front of you, as it were. I'd like you to take this out because we're going to close tonight by partaking of communion. And communion is meant to be, it looks just like this, communion is instituted by Jesus to be a reminder of the gospel. He said, whenever you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body which was broken for you. Then he took the cup and he said, this is my blood of the new covenant. Just as the blood would cleanse sin in the temple now the blood of Jesus cleanses us of our sin and as we think about those who have sinned against us and the need to forgive them we look to the gospel of how Jesus bore our sins on his body on the cross to give us his forgiveness and he says in the same way I've forgiven you forgive others we're going to close tonight by partaking of communion go ahead and peel back that first layer which exposes the bread and I want to do communion a little bit differently tonight we're going to apply forgiveness to communion. I want you to do this. I want you to think about an offense in your life. Maybe something that is still really real and raw. And I'm, we're going to, I want us to, in faith, apply the body and the blood of Jesus to that person's sin. We're going to forgive them tonight. Maybe you never have, but we're going to do it together. Maybe you've forgiven them a thousand times. Great. Well, this will be a thousand and one. We're going to, and we're just, just right in the quietness of your own heart. I want you to just see their sin that was perpetrated on you, put on Jesus on the cross. Whether it was abuse, whether it was words, whether it was neglect. And I want you to see their sin transferred to the body of Jesus on that cross. He died, not just for your sin, but for theirs also. We pray, Jesus, I thank you that you bore our sins on your body on that cross. And tonight, we choose, I choose, to forgive them and to apply the, your forgiveness, not just to me, but to them. Thank you for bearing all of our sins on your body. And I choose tonight to forgive this person because you've forgiven me. Thank you for your body that was broken in my place. In Jesus' name, amen. You can go ahead and partake of the bread. Then go ahead and peel back the second layer, which reveals the cup, which is symbolic of his blood. The blood, the Bible tells us, is life. And life, and the blood of Jesus brings life out of death. Brings life out of death. Every dead area, every dead thing, Jesus brings to life. And, and tonight we're going to pray and believing that God is going to fill us with his grace to continue to forgive. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace that is so far greater than any offense. You didn't die just for one person's sins. You died for the sins of the world. And it was so hard for you, God, but you did it for us. And so we choose today to forgive. 
And we say, empower us with your grace to live this way, to live as a Christian, following after you, forgiving them. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Thank you for your forgiveness. Amen. Go ahead and partake of the cup. I want to pray for you. Um, trash bins are going to come around. Just go ahead and drop those in there. With every head bowed and every eye closed, the one last thing. You're here and you, you're dealing with unforgiveness towards someone. Would you just lift your hands? I want to pray for us all in this room. Whether it's a, a parent, a co-worker, a boss, hands going up all over this place. God, I pray that your grace would fill us tonight. That we would go out of this place not carrying the baggage and the weight and the anger of hurt, but that you would take up our burdens, God, and that you would help us so that we could display the gospel when we leave this place. Everywhere that we go, that we would display the love and the mercy and the forgiveness of Jesus. People won't understand that. They're, they're not going to get why we would forgive. But God, it's an open door for us to not just talk about Jesus, but to display him. So Father, help us tonight. Fill us with your grace to continue to forgive just as You've forgiven us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Put your hands down. Amen and amen. Uh, thank you so much for being such a great church and, and, and listening to this word. I want to encourage you, if you're not in a grace group, get connected. And if you are, go this week because we want you to talk about it. It's one thing to, to think it up here. It's another thing to process it and, and have people around you encourage you and empower that forgiveness. I needed people around me to keep on encouraging me to forgive my dad and others that have, forg that have sinned against me. I couldn't have done it myself. You're... You're not in this alone, amen? That's why we're here, to help encourage one another as we walk this thing out in faith, amen? Amen, God bless you, Russell.